People say they want to reach Nibbana, so they crane their necks and look up into the vastness of space. They don't realize that no matter how far and hard they look, they still can't find it. It simply isn't within the realm of conventional reality. River and Ocean Rivers flow inexorably towards the sea, each with its own name and state of being. Once emptied into the vast ocean, however, the waters merge into one essential element and the rivers lose their individual identities. The river water is still there, but it no longer has separate characteristics apart from the ocean. River and ocean are neither the same, nor are they different. In a similar way, Machi Gao's pure essence of being had merged into the boundless ocean of Nibbana. The essence was the same, it had not changed. But it was indistinguishable from Nibbana's essential element of pure Tamma. And just as the river water cannot reunite with the stream, so the merged essence of mind can no longer link with past moments of consciousness that give birth to the illusion of self-continuity. Living in the timeless present, devoid of past and future, the essence does not reap the fruits of old Gamma or sow the seeds of new Gamma. It no longer leaves the slightest trace to mark its existence. For days the enlightened essence completely absorbed Mechigao's attention. The radiance of mind that she had valued so highly now appeared coarse and sullied by comparison, like dung next to gold. Eventually, through the natural flow of consciousness, the mind essence began reconnecting with her faculties of awareness and with the physical presence of her body, those factors of her worldly personality that were still bound to the cycle of birth and death. Manchi Gao's conscious mind and her physical body were the surviving remnants of aeons of past gamma, and they would continue to experience the consequences of those past actions until their disintegration at the time of death. Though all attachment to them had been dissolved in the great ocean of Nibbana, body and mind continued to function normally in their own natural spheres. But, because the mind essence was purified, each thought was an expression of freedom from delusion, and each gesture was an expression of enlightenment. Living in the world, but no longer of the world, Machi Gao's mind was untouched by mundane desires. Because her body and mind were results of the past gamma that lingered on, she thought to unravel the fabric of her past existence to see where it led. Through the power of her divine eye, she began to reflect upon the lack of a beginning to the history of her former embodiment. She was amazed to find out how many times she had been born and how many times she had died, to see how many lifetimes she had spent traversing the immeasurable expanse of sentient existence. If the countless corpses that she had discarded along the way were scattered across the countryside, there would not be an empty stretch of ground left. Imagine the amount of time it took to be born and to die that many times. It was impossible to count all the births and deaths. There were far, far too many to even try. She felt deep dismay as she reviewed her past. Why, being born into suffering so often, had she constantly endeavored to be born again? Eventually, her focus turned to the innumerable corpses that have been discarded at death by each and every person living in the world. She saw the same situation everywhere. All living beings, whether male or female, have exactly the same history of death and rebirth. All are caught in the same vicious cycle. Everyone is equal in that respect. There is no injustice and no inequality. Just karmic causes and conditions leading to the many recurring forms of becoming and dissolution. Stretching back indefinitely, she saw sentient existence crowded with the remains of death and decay. It was an unforgettable sight. Mechigao had always been compassionate. She was deeply sympathetic to the spiritual fate of her fellow human beings. But the reality of the supreme tamma which now filled her heart transcended all forms of human conception. How could she possibly explain the true nature of that tamma to others? Even if she tried, ordinary people, steeped in delusion, could never hope to comprehend such extraordinary purity of mind. She was unlikely to find enough receptive ears to make teaching worthwhile. Consequently, Mechi Gao initially felt little incentive to speak about her experience. As though, having found a way out, 
she was satisfied to escape alone. She was free to live a life of perfect solitude for her remaining years. It was sufficient that she had fully realized her lifelong aspiration of reaching Nibbana. She saw no reason to burden herself with troublesome teaching duties. Further reflection led her to the Lord Buddha and his guiding role in revealing the true path to the cessation of suffering. Reconsidering the transcendent tamma and the path she took to uncover it, she finally recognized herself in everyone else. She too was a person like them. Certainly others with strong spiritual tendencies were equally as capable as she was. Reverently reviewing all aspects of the Buddha's teaching, she saw its relevance for people the world over and its potential rewards for those who were willing to practice correctly. Those insights gave her a renewed desire to help every living being that was willing to listen. Mechi Gao had spent nearly two years in virtual seclusion within the nunnery, striving for liberation with a single-minded intensity. Now she shed her self-isolation to become more intimately involved with the day-to-day -day matters of her monastic community. She wanted to ensure, as best she could, that each of her spiritual companions had the best opportunity to realize her full potential. She was, however, somewhat handicapped in her teaching skills. Machi Gao, the person, was essentially a simple, uneducated countrywoman who had never been very eloquent or articulate when expressing her ideas. Being a karmic legacy of her transient personality, this deeply ingrained aspect of her character did not change. She was only comfortable when speaking in the local Putai dialect, voicing her remarks in the plain and earthy language of rural folk. Rhetorical skill was a gift that she had never possessed. For that reason, her teachings tended to be brief, direct, and simple succinct explanations that cut straight to the heart of the matter, leaving much of the broader implications to the listener's own deduction. While Machi Gao knew intuitively the fundamental moral bias of each person's heart, and the advice that each needed to hear, she was hampered in articulating that guidance in a lengthy discourse by an inability to elaborate and expand verbally on her mind's conceptual formations. To Machi Gao's clear and penetrating wisdom, those who really knew the truth remained silent while those who talked often about the truth, in fact, knew very little. Life at Banhui Sai Nunnery had maintained a balance between focus on the meditation practice and service to the local community, and Machi Gao found herself in a central position to address the needs and aspirations of both sides. Realizing that each nun was practicing at a specific level in her meditation, she encouraged her sisters individually in their practice, speaking from the unique perspective of someone who had passed through all levels and beyond all barriers. Her uncompromising diligence made her presence an inspiration to all the nuns, a living testament to their own inherent possibilities. Decades of enduring the rigors of village life had given her an empathetic appreciation of the burdens borne by village women in their daily lives. Now she advised them on the smallest and most mundane matters with simple homespun wisdom, born of respect and mutual understanding. Those who entered the nunnery to seek her help encountered her serene countenance and a heartfelt joy that lifted ordinary people to a higher and brighter conscious plane beyond the suffering of their mundane existence. Most of all, she took a special interest in the welfare of invisible beings from the non-physical planes of existence. In the late hours of the night, she often received guests from the various spirit realms. She ministered to ghosts and celestial beings in equal numbers, employing a fluency and silent dialogue that she had mastered from an early age. Because those discussions were communicated in the language of the heart, thus circumventing the constraints of verbal expression, her advice flowed freely, as unbounded as her pure love and compassion. Because of those special talents, Manchi Gao felt a personal responsibility toward the inhabitants of the spirit worlds for the rest of her life. Even in old age and failing health, she never tired of lending her assistance.